Great. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar on reactive relational database connectivity for Java applications. Uh, I'm Sashi. I will be moderating this webinar. Uh, I know it's late here in India, but I'm sure that every bit of time that you spend here is, is worth your while. Uh, first, a quick introduction to start off uh, for those of you who are joining our webinars for the first time. Uh, at start off, uh, you know, our, you know we're, we're a vibrant community of uh, Java developers uh, uh, where, you know, uh, people sort of come together to uh, discover uh, interesting career opportunities, you know, find uh, engaging resources to learn new things, and uh, more importantly, the opportunity to kind of network with experts and, and, and seek help if they're stuck, uh, you know, uh, if they're stuck with something. Uh, the main purpose of our webinars, uh, uh, you know, the monthly webinars that we do is to help developers, uh, you know, learn new frameworks and tools that make them productive. Uh, because the tech space is continuously evolving and we want developers to kind of stay updated on, 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 on really the, the cutting edge of uh, software development. Uh, you know, we bring great speakers, uh, you know, like the one we have today uh, from the tech world to talk about new tools, languages and frameworks. Uh, you know, joining us today, uh, you know, is uh, Alejandro Duarte. Uh, you know, he joins us from Finland, uh, you know, minus nine degrees, very cold there. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, uh, and, and and also you know just to kind of uh, you know help you avoid uh, making the mistake of confusing him with uh, a Peruvian football player of the same name. You know, let me quickly introduce uh, uh, you know our Alejandro uh, to you all. Uh, Alejandro, you know, is a software engineer, uh, published author, and a developer advocate at uh, MariaDB, uh, MariaDB Corporation. Uh, you know, he he graduated in computer science from the National University of Colombia. Uh, you know, uh, he he learned how to program. Uh, using the basic programming language at the age of 13. Uh, uh, you know, he has worked on numerous software development projects, uh, you know, both in startups and large companies. Uh, he, he is a very, you know, uh, uh, popular and well-known face in the Java and Wadin communities. Uh, he published several articles, you know, and videos with hundreds and thousands of views. Uh, if you go see the official Wadin channel, you know, you, you'll find a lot of interesting videos by Alejandro. Uh, he also speaks at international Java conferences and Java user groups. Uh, you know, quick uh, you know recommendation. You know, he wrote two uh, you know great books. Uh, you know, uh, Practical Wadin, Data Centric Applications with Wadin Eight, and Wadin Seven UI Design by Example, A Beginner's Guide. Uh, so both books you know are well reviewed. So you know, do check them out uh, if you're interested in learning Wadin. Uh, his professional interest, you know, Alejandro's professional interest, gravitate towards developer relations practices. Uh, you know, open source, uh, software projects, API adoption, online community growth, reusable software components, microservices, web applications, video game development, quite a, quite a bit more. Uh, uh, his favorite programming languages are Java and C++. Uh, you know, uh, Alejandro spreads his free time uh, between his uh, family, friends, and uh, a Nikon DSLR camera, and a couple of electric guitars. And uh, if, you play, if you pay attention, you know, you would see one in the background there. Uh, so, uh, and you can follow him on Twitter uh, at Alejandro underscore du. Uh, his Twitter handle is very popular. He keeps posting interesting links uh, uh, frequently. Uh, so, so do do follow his uh, Twitter handle. Uh, so, you know, with, with Alejandro's introduction done, you know, let me quickly, you know, uh, you know, pause for a minute, you know, thank him for taking the time out. Alejandro, you know, it's a pleasure, pleasure to, great pleasure to have you on the webinar. Thank you, Sajid. That, that was an amazing uh, introduction. Really appreciate it. Actually, you saved now some time in the first slide there. I was going to show the book, so that we we'll have to go through that very quickly, which is good. <laughs> right, right. And I'll just take another minute and then you know, quickly introduce the topic and get out of the way. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you know, uh, anybody who uh, you know, has like, been working in the Java world for a long time, uh, know that reactive programming is the hottest topic in the programmer land today. Uh, you know, every programmer wants to kind of jump into it and, and, and do it. And then, you know, one of the things that's not really solved, at least, you know, uh, as much as the other pieces have been solved is the database connectivity. And, you know, uh, you know R2DBC, you know, just the short form for reactive relational database connectivity uh, is a way to consume, uh, you know, SQL, da uh, SQL databases from Java applications. Uh, so it's a new specification currently in version 0 0.9 with ambitious goals for modern database access. Uh, several mainstream database vendors have embraced the specification. So in this talk, you know, uh, Alejandro is going to like, you know, explore the practical uh, 
uh, you know, side of using, you know, something like the open source MariaDB uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, and our favorite programming language, Java, uh, to kind of see how, you know, R2, R2 DBC can be, uh, can be done and how it sort of, you know, uh, improves the performance of applications and, and makes for very, very fast applications. So, so, uh, so that's the topic, a very interesting topic. We have 50 minutes to cover it, uh, you know, and then and, and 10 minutes at the end for any questions you may have. So any questions that you have, feel free to kind of, you know, uh, type them out in the chat. Uh, you know, we will have Alejandro uh, take a look at them and answer them for you. But yeah, so, uh, you know, with that, you know, I, I'll get out of the way and let uh, Alejandro begin the webinar. Over to you, Alejandro. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let me uh, share my screen. Let's see if this works. Uh, uh, can you confirm if you can see my screen? Yes, we do. All right, so I have this uh, weird Zoom. I'm gonna put it over here. All right, so yeah. Um, welcome to Reactive Relational Database Connectivity. Uh, for Java applications, uh, before we start, actually, uh, I wanted to show you uh, just very quickly, a little bit about myself, although that was a great introduction. So Alejandro Larte, I'm a developer advocate for MariaDB Corporation. There are two things. So there is a MariaDB Foundation that you can find at uh, mariadb.org, which uh, they, they, their mission is kind of to uh, 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 make sure that the um, uh, open source GPL licensed uh, MariaDB community server um, continues to evolve, continues to be developed, and that no single company can uh, kind of control the development of these uh, databases, uh, which is uh, uh, kind of to prevent what happened with, uh, with uh, MySQL, right? Uh, when, when Oracle um, acquired um, Sun. So the other one, it's MariaDB Corporation and you find it at mariadb.com. And so MariaDB uh, Corporation is, is the, I would say the main contributor to the uh, MariaDB community server, uh, but it has a bunch of really cool technologies. So for example, there is the enterprise server. MariaDB enterprise server is kind of a, production ready. It's tailored to production environments. It's more secure, it's uh, faster. Uh, it's, it's the way to go when you go to production, really. Uh, there's MariaDB max scale, which is a database proxy. So if you have many uh, uh, MariaDBs, right, servers, max scale is gonna make it look like, like if it's only one and then you, your application just see, sees one, kind of one instance in a way but it directs the writes and reads and maybe analytic uh, queries to, to, the, to the best um, option there in, the, in this cluster. There is a MariaDB column in storage. So MariaDB has uh, um, the concept of engines and, and you can use multiple engines in one single database. And you can have one table in one, uh, using one engine and another using another engine. And in the same query, you can actually join those. It's pretty cool. So, one of those is column storage. There are many others. I'm just showing here one. Column storage for analytical purposes. Analytical in the sense of uh, maybe you need queries that kind of sum all the values in one column or maybe uh, calculate an average or any other function really. So column storage is super fast. And the more data you have there, the faster uh, kind of, uh, or, or, or the bigger the, the, the gain is in, in velocity and in performance. And there's MariaDB Expand. It's also super cool because it enables something called distributed SQL. So you bring all the benefits from the NoSQL world now to the relational uh, world. And so, so you pretty much only need to, something like MariaDB. Uh, you have relational data there. Uh, you have uh, all, the, all the advantages of having a schema. Plus now you can really uh, serve uh, millions of queries uh, per second. Pretty cool. And there is a, a, a Sky SQL, which is a database as a service, and you can have all these uh, um, technologies there in the cloud. Uh, let's face it, nobody wants to really to, to administrate a, a database. If you can just put somewhere else, like in the cloud, and uh, Sky SQL offers you kind of have tools to automate a bunch of things so that the uh, that you can configure rules, for example, so that uh, you have a more capacity in certain days. Uh, it's pretty cool. You should uh, check that out. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I work for MariaDB Corporation, which is uh, developing all these cool technologies. And I'm the author of, of these uh, two books. Uh, they, they were already mentioned. I just wanted to say that the Practical Lighting was uh, uh, published uh, just uh, some months ago. Um, and it, it, it teaches you from the beginning 
uh, web development in Java, and then it moves towards Vadin, modern Vadin. Um, Vadin is a, is a technology to, to build uh, front ends using, yeah, exactly, my favorite programming language, or maybe our favorite programming language, Java. But you don't have to use JavaScript, you don't have to use HTML. So it's pretty cool, you should check it out because maybe it's a very um, interesting option for your next project. But anyway, we want to talk about reactive relational database connectivity for Java applications. And here's the plan. So first, we're gonna add a part to this talk called reactive programming, because I think it's very important to understand kind of the, the, the at least the core concept of reactive programming, and we will see it uh, in action. Mm. After that, we're going to code uh, blocking services, a REST service. Uh, we're going to use uh, Spring here, um, but we're we're use we're, we're going to make it blocking. That's kind of the opposite of reactive, which is what we are going to do next. And we not only we are going to make this uh, service reactive, but we are going to include reactivity at the communication layer between uh, the, the the Java application and the and the database. Mm. Then we're going to do something very interesting, which is comparing performance, because it's very, very important. Uh, I cannot stress this enough. Uh, performance, uh, you need to consider certain things there. And it's not that reactive programming is, you know, silver bullet. No, uh, it works in certain scenarios. It might not work in others. And so I'm going to show you that as well. I'm going to give you some hints. Uh, by no means, I'm an expert on uh, on 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 every single you know kind of architecture or or domain. So you will have to test this yourself and find if you have the use case for uh, for reactive uh, programming. Um, uh, so I hope that part is going to be interesting for you. Um, so what we are going to try to do here is to run this talk for startup. That um, big shout out to them. Uh, great, uh, great talks. I, I have seen in the uh, uh, YouTube uh, channel. You should check it out. Uh, very interesting talks there. Mm. So, so, so yeah, definitely check it out. But we need to catch exceptions, especially this one demo effect exception, because you now when you are coding live, something could go wrong. And in that case, what we are going to try to do is we're going to get all of you, all the attendees to this talk. And as you can see, it's a stream. So we're going to filter this. And the attendee class has a has fix method that returns a boolean, so we can filter. So if somebody has a fix, we're going to find the first. We're optimistic, and and we uh, we're sure that uh, we we so we believe that the first one is gonna is gonna have the right answer. In which case, I, I'm just uh, going to get the fix. From you and it's an optional so if present then i will apply the fix so as you can see it's already code in the agenda of this uh talk that's because i really really want to work with code it's the best way i think to understand things but this time i'm gonna have some slides too because uh, you know it's a good tool as well um these are streams actually this last part here this is java streams it's not reactive but it kind of gets a bit it's one step towards that. So let me show you a bunch of things here. Let me jump to uh, IntelliJ idea. So I created this pro this uh, project um, that really it doesn't have uh, much here. Let me show it. So it's uh, where is it? It's called uh, reactive programming, and I just added something called project reactor. I'm going to explain a little bit about the ecosystem later, but uh, it's uh, it's a library to do prog uh, reactive programming. Uh, one of the options. So I added it, uh, the best way to add it is to use the bomb. So you don't have to worry about the versions here, this bill of materials. And then I have core and test. We are not gonna use test really. I could easily uh, delete that dependency, but I just want to show you that that exists uh, because testing is also special with reactive programming. Uh, this would require maybe a, a complete talk about it. So we are not going to go through that. And I'm using project Lombug, which kind of saves, saves time in, you know, in this kind of situations is great and presentation is just very good because it saves some time. Uh, I'm not sure if I would use it in production, maybe in some project, yeah, in some other projects um, might not be the best idea. Um, there's a lot of controversy over project <laughs> Lombok. I like it, I have to say that I like it. And so we're gonna use it here, all right. Mm. So this is empty really, this project is empty. Here's a, an empty package. So I'm gonna create a new Java class called 
application and is going to have a public static void main method, right? The entry point. And so you probably know about uh, Java streams, right? Streams. So this interface, and there are other interfaces like int stream. And for example, we can create a range of numbers. So it's kind of a sequence of numbers, or we can actually define which number we want. So for example, one, two, two again, and two even again, I know three, four, five, let's do eight, seven, six. Uh, and then we can operate on this uh, stream of data or of objects. So for example, for each, we are going to take that integer and going to do system out print line that we of course can replace this with a, uh, 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 a method reference and which run the project, we see the numbers here. One, two, 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 three, three, well, et cetera. Now, okay, cool, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I really don't like that they're that this repeated, the number two is repeated. So uh, maybe we can call distinct. So let's run that again. And now we have one, two, three, four, five, eight, come on, it should be six. So let's uh, call sorted. Uh, so as you can see, I'm, I'm just manipulating this data here. It's one, two, three, four, five, and eight, well, whatever. Uh, um, how about, you know what? I'm not interested in the number three for some reason. So we can filter it out. So I shouldn't be three, right? So different than three. And we have one, two, four, five, six, seven. Um, what else? Another oper operation that is uh, very, very common is uh, map, map to uh, maybe uh, kind of the same data type or map to an, another object. So in this case, we're gonna take uh, the integer and say number plus that integer. So now it's a string and print line is going to print a string. Here you can see it, right? So this is just a really fancy iterator, really. Java streams are just a fancy iterator. Let me show you something which is important. So if I assign this to a new variable here, is it now the stream, right? And I, let's say I wanted to use it again. So let's do a for each and just a system out print line. So you would expect that now we are going to print all those numbers, but instead we get an illegal state exception because the stream has already been operated upon or closed. Uh, so you can reuse that. That's an important uh, thing uh, to keep in mind. Mm. We're going to see that with reactive programming, this is different. Mm. So again, a very fancy, very, very cool. I, I actually like this uh, uh, kind of uh, iterating over a sequence of objects. Now, what if we had a service? Let me show you something. Let's create a service here. Service. This could be a REST service and, and a kind of endpoints there. Uh, we're not really going to, to code. Um, uh, our service right now. We're gonna do it later though. Uh, but uh, let's say we have a public static um, method that returns a, an int stream again. Int stream get number stream, and we're gonna return just an int stream, um, and we can generate this. So this could be like infinite. And let me finish this line here like that. And for example, we can just return something like math.random. Let's multiply by 10, whatever, it doesn't matter. Just I just want some numbers. Of course, we need to cast this, but let's say this takes time. So thread, the infamous thread.sleep. Um, infamous because we now have to have this try catch here, right? Uh, we could, we could uh, uh, encapsulate this somewhere, but I just want to simulate that, hey, you know, generating this data which yeah, it's a random number. So, but generating this data takes time, takes uh, one second. Uh, so let's use it in the application. So back to the application class, just uh, to show you. So we have the service dot um, get number stream and then for each system out. Just to show you what, what we are doing here in a visual way, right? The output of this program is just, it's gonna generate numbers randomly forever. Of course, not forever, forever for the, for the JVM, but we can kill it here. <laughs> and uh, this is how we use it. But what if we, what if we had, let's simulate the situation of a, of, a, of a web server. So in a web server, you have a bunch of users and the users are 
uh, kind of uh, handled through different threads, but threads are expensive. You cannot create just infinite, an infinite amount of, an infinite number of threads. Uh, so let's simulate that. So for that, I'm going to use the executors dot new fixed thread pool. We're going to have two. Of course, uh, you can have ten, a thousand, whatever is uh, the configuration. But let's say let's limit these to two, so you so we get the the the, the point here. And this is just a thread pool. That means they are reusable threads because they are expensive, right? So this this thread pool is going to maintain two threads. And when when somebody asks me to to run something in this thread, I'm going to do it. If I find one that's free, uh, I'll do it. And then please return that thread when you are done. Mm. So that's what we are going to do here. So I could I could preferably use another stream here, but I'm just I'm just going to iterate this way so we don't get confused. Uh, so let's say, actually, this is kind of the user, right? So the user number one, and let's create 10 users, U plus plus. Uh, and then let's create, let's use a, a var here because it's gonna be clear that this is a string. Um, user is gonna be user plus this number. And for each user, what I want to do is take this thread and submit a new, um, a new task, which is a runnable. Right. I'm just going to submit task here, really. That's it. That's all I want to do. Now we have we have only two uh, threads, but uh, once the one thread is done, then you should take the other one, right? And for this, we're going to use the service and get the number stream. Uh, and uh, let's um, actually let's do this for each. No, you know what? Let's map first to object and say, well, we have the user. Kind of the username, if you wish. And then we're going to print the random number that we got from that stream. Of course, it's a lambda expression, so I need to uh, uh, define it properly. Now, uh, it's mapped. We are not doing anything with that, but we can now for each just system out for inline. Uh, oops. System out. Why is that? Well, I can type it right. System out print line. We go. So we print that. Oh, it's because uh, it was filtered <laughs> for each. There we go. And uh, again, this is a uh, method reference. Should be like that. Okay, perfect. So it's compiling. Let's remove that import from there. Um, so uh, actually, let's, let's just run this. We kind of suspect seeing like 10 users receiving random numbers every second, but let's see what actually happens. As you can see, only user one and two are receiving their random numbers here. So um, what is going on here? Uh, let's have a look at the, at, the, at the code and understand. So, okay, we're iterating here. Then we take one of these threads or we submit, I'm sorry, we submit one task to one of these two threads. So the thread pool takes one and that's user one, maybe. So it says, okay, sure, I have a thread free. Nobody's using threads right now, so run it. And it goes through this thing, but this for each or this line is gonna be there forever. It's blocking, right? It's blocking this thread. This is a different thread and we have a, another one, the main thread here. And this is now a different thread. Then it iterates again, number two, submit a new task. Sure, I'd still have another one because I have two. So I start that, it's running, it's creating all these numbers, it's or running all these uh, logic here. Then it iterates again, submit, and the third pool goes, all right, well, I don't have any more of that, so sure, I'll take this, but uh, you'll have to wait. I mean, uh, I cannot run it because I don't have any threads at all. And it never gets, so it, it completes this for loop, but it never gets a free thread because we are blocking. So that's that's the point here. Let me kill this machine here. Uh, that's what's going on here. So what if we use, and there, there are ways of course to fix this, right? <laughs> the easiest would be just have a bunch of uh, uh, threads there, but that's gonna uh, consume memory and maybe it's not efficient or we can do, we could do something about these two. Kind of not not block, but it will require you can imagine coding some more stuff. So with reactive programming, 
uh, we can make a different version of this method. So let's do that static. And instead of returning an int stream, we're going to return something called flux. This is from project reactor. Here we go, reactor. And it's a flux of integers. Flux is just, we are going to produce, produce a sequence of integers here. In fact, a flux in the in terminology more like a, more, I, I don't know if to say it that way, but more standard terminology is a producer, really. Uh, I'll show you something more about this. Just bear with me for, for now, and let's create this method, get uh, number flux. And the cool thing is that it's actually easier to implement this because there is uh, an interval method here, and you can say uh, um, duration of seconds, one second. And now we have kind of, uh, we need to map these to because this, I think it's a long, is it? Yeah, so we have a long number here. And we, we just need the uh, a random a random uh, integer. So let me copy and paste that there. And of course, we just return this thing. Uh, so it's equivalent. Back to the, back to the, where is the application here? Back to the application, this one, all right? So what if instead of using get number stream, which is blocking, get number flux? So, okay, but here's uh, the good thing that it, it's, if you already know JavaScript, it's it kind of the, the, the way you configure a flux is, is the same. So instead of uh, map to object, we just use map. And instead of for each, for each this is very important, you sus subscribe to this producer or this flux, right? They're kind of synonymous uh, for now, uh, flux and, and a producer. And what this does is, uh, it's gonna execute this at some point in the future, not not right now, at some point later, but this thread's gonna have the chance to uh, kind of finish and return the thread to the pool. And we can see it in action actually. So now we see users one, two, three, four, five, all the 10 users are getting their random numbers from the from the service because we are not blocking. So again, we go through this for loop user one, submit the task, this gets executed. It doesn't wait here. It goes there, gets executed. It doesn't wait there. It's just then, then later uh, uh, project reactor calling this part here. So this is just an example. It's not really a true comparison, but why is this better than the other? It's just to, to, to show you the nature of, re, of uh, re, reactive programming. That's, and that's the whole intention of this piece of code. So it's not blocking threads. And it's very important to not block pretty much any call that, that is gonna take time. That's, that's the premise of uh, reactive, the reactive programming paradigm. So let me get back to this slide to show you something. So there's something called the reactive manifesto, which uh, lays out all the uh, reactive programming paradigm. So, you should check it if you haven't. It's not a new thing. It's actually, the reactive programming is pretty old now. Uh, sign the manifesto. Uh, there's something called the reactive foundation which serves as a catalyst of all things reactive. It doesn't matter the programming language, just uh, this foundation uh, kind of uh, uh, serves that function. And there's a reactive X mm, API, but API here is not as, as an interface. So application programming interface, that interface is not in the Java sense where you have a, um, a um, let me check here the chat real quick. Uh, um, where was I? An interface in the Java sense that you have a, just what the interface does, but it's not implemented, right? No, this is actually implementation and implementation of, of uh, asynchronous programming with observable streams. Mm. In fact, there are many. As you can see, there, it says choose your platform. That means there are several programming languages. So you get it for Python, C Sharp, PHP, um, Kotlin, um, many others. And of course, of course, it has to be Java right there. So uh, the, uh, the, the Java part, it's called um, Rx Java, right? So remember, Reactive X. So this is Reactive X Java. Uh, this is something you can use. It's ready to use. It's not interfaces. It's used, and it's based on something called 
well, it's an implementation for reactive extensions. I, I should have mentioned that these X is like kind of you can read as extension. Uh, so R X Java, it's an implementation of this. We could have used that in the previous demo, but I was using Project Reactor, which is another implementation of uh, not not uh, uh, Reactive X, but it includes actually all the operators that you find in Reactor X. Mm, but it's a, it's another in, uh, implementation of uh, of uh, kind of uh, the observable pattern. It, they just use different kind of uh, names for the classes, but semantically is the same. They serve the same function. And it's based on something called reactive streams. So you can see it's a lot of things here, but uh, I hope it's, it's again some clarity. Uh, reactive stream is something in Java. So this, this is just, these are just interfaces really. No implementation at all, just Java interfaces. And in fact, there is not that many, but then Java, the JDK 9 also has the same in the uh, concurrent dot flow class. It's a class and inside that class there are interfaces. They just copied them from here, kind of aiming at, uh, well, you don't need to include anything from outside because reactive is, is getting, it's getting traction. This uh, many years ago, of course, uh, JDK 9. Uh, however, you know, there are uh, still a lot of people using Java 8 and, uh, and so projects like uh, say uh, Jakarta E, well, you cannot use anything outside uh, the JVM or inside these, these projects. Um, so they, they added these, but they added in JDK 9. So what about JDK 8? So projects such as uh, uh, Jakarta uh, MicroProfile, for example, I know they are working on, on the reactive uh, stuff as well. And they, they made an exception. They are actually using uh, reactive streams as an, kind of an interim, right? But later at some point with adoption of, of JDK 9 and plus, and hopefully not, not 9, but uh, uh, 17 today, mm, mm, I get, um, you know, when, when Java 8, it's like a thing of the past, maybe everybody's gonna move towards this implementation. So you need to, to, to import anything really uh, in, the, in the Palm Direct XML file, for example. Uh, so reactive streams, I said, those are interfaces and there are only four. I'm showing here three, but there are actually four. Um, there is another one uh, uh, called the processor, but it doesn't matter. So we have a publisher. We use one already, kind of. It's not in the not in the in the or object oriented. It's not in the object oriented sense. Since um, uh, 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 this actually, let me show you the where is it? The flux interface is not a. It's not really publisher as such, right? Actually it is, okay. Yeah, sir, it is, it is a publisher, but from reactive streams. Oh, well, actually I'm, I'm showing you reactive streams. Uh, so it's the same, but it has it has more, more stuff there, right? Because it's implementation, it can add some ethics. Eh? Now there's a subscriber too. So a publisher is just a thing that creates a sequence of elements. And a publisher, uh, sorry, a subscriber subscribes to a publisher so that, for example, when there's a new element, I can do something. So I just need to implement this part. Or if there's an error, I can implement this. It's very nice error handling here, by the way. We're not going to see this in, in this presentation. And your very important concept is that of uh, the one you see inside the subscription, which is kind of a one to one relationship here. Uh, it has the request long n, so give me n elements, and that's called back pressure. It's very, very important, very powerful, because it kind of it's a mixture of pull and push techniques here. Uh, we're not gonna go that deep here in this presentation, um, but it's important that you, you have a look at that. And there is also um, the um, there is also the uh, processor, which is a uh, it's not here, but it's a publisher and it's a subscriber at the same time, so you can manipulate data. Mm. How about R2DBC? What is that? So uh, we've seen a lot of uh, reactive things and now it's another one, reactive relational database connectivity. That's where it is. So it's relational, uh, reactive relational database connectivity. So it brings the uh, reactive programming um, paradigm to actually the layer between the Java application and the uh, database. Why is that needed? Well, JBC has some limitations and, and I'm not saying this like uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not good or anything. And most of the applications use it successfully. And actually 
uh, it, it could be a, a better option in many cases. So again, reactive is not in, it's not the solution. You need to have the use case. Sometimes you don't have the use case and JDBC is just gonna be better, not only because it's simpler and you, uh, it's, uh, you, you don't have to think about events going from one place to another and all these things. It, it makes debugging really, really hard. Uh, but when you have the case, it could, it could be that a reactive application is there. So what I have here is a reactive application. That's good. Let's say it's good because we have the use case, but we have the JDBC API, maybe you're using JPA or Duke or any other uh, library, but you, eventually you're using the DBC under the hood through a blocking driver. So when you have something blocking, it doesn't make sense to have a reactive system. It's, it's no longer a reactive system as such. So you have from the, if it's a web application, from the uh, web browser, the request to the server, that communication should be non-blocking. Then from the server, when you when you uh, query, for example, a database, that should be also non-blocking, but JDBC doesn't allow you to do that. Uh, the solution is to use something else, and that's called R2DBC. And with that, you can become, or your application is fully reactive. So there is no blocking in this kind of, uh, all these requests and responses over there. Um, and, and the way it works is just through a service uh, provider API, which is a standard thing in Java to kind of discover classes at runtime. And so you, uh, you can discover a driver, right? Or well, the application, um, R2DBC discovers a driver and use it, uses the driver to communicate with the database. So it's replacing JDBC really, right? It's just that now it's reactive. Um, all major databases implement R2DBC drivers, which is very cool. Of course, MariaDB implements that as well. In fact, uh, uh, my friend Rob, he wrote a book about it. He works also for MariaDB Corporation. Really, really, really good book about R2DBC. It's that book if you want to learn this. Uh, I highly recommend it. It has a really nice introduction also to reactive programming. You should check it out. And back to service provider interfaces. So we have kind of the elements that, that you will end up using when you're using R2BC. There are many, but uh, I want to focus on these, these ones. So the connection factory, and this should look kind of familiar if you have used JDBC. Connection factory creates a connection, obviously. And from that connection, you can get a statement to run a query from which you can get a result that has rows. It's kind of the relationship here. So let me show you some of these more like in, inside what is going on. So the interface uh, called a connection factory, for example. So you see there that there is a create method, but it doesn't return a connection. It returns a publisher and a publisher is an interface from reactive streams, right? So this is when you create the connection, you don't get the connection right away. You will get it in the future. You can, it's like, okay, create, please create uh, a connection. Sure, here is a publisher. So subscribe to that, that publisher if you want to get that connection. That's what's happening here. Uh, so once you have uh, well, that connection, you can run a bunch of operations that you should be familiar with if you have been working with your DBC or, or databases in general. You can begin a transaction, you can commit a transaction, you can create a statement with, a, with some uh, SQL or SQL a query here. You can close the connection as well. And then there are many other methods there. Mm. And for that, when, once you create the, uh, um, the statement you receive, I'm just uh, I'm going back to the previous slide now. Next slide, statement has the execute method, which also is not, here's the result of the, of the query. No, no, no. Here's a publish share from where, from where you can get in the future the result of this query. So you don't have to block this thread. Just subscribe to that and I call that and all the methods to kind of pass parameters to the SQL query um, that you can expect. Um, they are called here actually bind, right? So that's a, a difference with, with JDBC. Uh, but I find it even actually, it, it's actually nicer. Um, then you have the result, which is what you get. And there is a kind of a, a map uh, a method here that also returns a publisher, but the important part is that you can take row items. So a row, allows you to get the values in each column, right? For that row by index or maybe by the column name as well. But how, how can you use this? So here's uh, an example. And first of all, notice that I'm using here MariaDB uh, uh, implementations, but uh, uh, for any other database, it's gonna be almost the same. And I'm creating a configuration. Now I'm doing uh, 
uh, a call to different uh, methods here to configure each kind of um, aspect of the uh, of the connection, but you can do it even one string if you wanted, uh, just like JDBC, right? The, the connection string. Mm, the important thing is that you can have this, this configuration to create a connection factory. And with that, you can get actually a connection, right? Now, hmm, there's a blog there. I shouldn't do that, read. I should have just uh, subscribed to this. And once I get the connection, do something. Now, maybe in, in most use cases, you can do much if you don't have the connection. So it might, uh, maybe it makes sense, but uh, what you should actually do is just uh, subscribe to this. Anyway, here is a select. So um, it's very similar to, or kind of similar to JDBC. You create a statement. Uh, you can also, well, bind parameters there. This doesn't have any, like if there was a where uh, ID equals something, right? Um, then you execute that statement and you get a publisher. From that publisher, you can create a flux. So it doesn't, because the, 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 the RTDBC uh, specification is made so that uh, you can use any, um, any implementation of, of reactive streams. So here's kind of one of those, the, the one provided by the uh, uh, project reactor. So you can create from a publisher from reactive streams, you can create a flux now. It's, just, it's kind of the same again, a, a publisher you can subscribe to it, right? And then the important thing here is that you get the result and then you get all the rows that you can then convert to a new task, a new Java object from a table to a, to a Java object. Uh, you get the, 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 the values in each column for each row and then you subscribe and then you start getting the tasks that form these uh, the result set, right? Um, and this happens in the future somewhere. So you I mean, while you can do other things. Mm. Now, this is pretty involved, I would say. It's a lot of code. And yeah, that's one of these disadvantages. For example, you cannot use JPA with uh, RTDBC. It's just, uh, 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 JPA is, uh, is um, only compatible with, let's put that with JDBC. Uh, so when you have a task that has, for example, let's say they had, uh, category or a user or something, you will have to build that. There is a way to do it through mappers, but, but you will have to implement that. So just let's keep that in mind. Um, fortunately, there are clients for R2DBC. It's kind of something that sits on top of R2DBC that makes uh, programming simpler. And, and there's a JOOQ, J-O-O-Q, a great framework uh, for a relational uh, database mapping to Java objects uh, or to execute actually uh, SQL queries directly from Java. Mm, you should check it out if you haven't. And there is uh, probably the, one of the most uh, uh, popular ones, uh, Spring Data RTDBC. There are others, but we're going to stick to this one. Um, and that's what I'm going to show you right now. So I previously created also a project. Let me close this so I don't get this uh, confused. Um, I created uh, a project called blocking service. So we're gonna do this blocking. Let's see if we have the time. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that I'm running out of time right now, but I have a lot to show you still. Anyway, blocking service, I created with start.spring.io, then I imported it here. I have uh, data JPA, starter web, spring security, only because I need a class from there. We are not gonna use spring security really. Dev tool, so we didn't have to uh, uh, um, restart the server manually uh, many times. The Java client for JDBC and MariaDB and Lombok again, and tests where we're going to use that. So that's what I have, but it's it's empty. It's really what the starter generated, and I'll also have a MariaDB database here called World, Wordle, and we have the now topic. We are not interested in topic only Word. It has bunch of things, but we only want the ID and text, okay? Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, let's uh, check something out here. Select uh, count all from word. So we know how many, uh, 370,000 uh, uh, rows. Okay, so we have an idea of what we're de dealing with. So let's create a new entity, word entity. And I'm using Lombok, so let's just use data here to generate getters, getters, setters, all that. And of course we need a, an ID. 
annotated with ID from Java X persistence. Remember this, Java X persistence, that's, that's uh, JPI string text. That's it really. I think uh, we have an entity now, let's create a new uh, word repository. And it's actually not a class, but an interface that extends the APA repository of word with ID of type long. And let's create here a public, well, we don't need public, so it's an interface list of words. Typical repository, find words. Let's find words here. And actually let's allow the, the, the client of this class to specify a limit. So we don't get absolutely all the 300,000 plus <clears throat> words that we have there. Now, <coughs> excuse me, let's create a query using <clears throat> this feature of Java and let's make it uh, a native query. And let's select, uh, I think it was ID and text from word order by rand. So we're, get, we're gonna get random words, limit, limit. Uh, this should be like this limit. So it's actually this one over here. Right, mm, or is this red? What's going on here? Let's see. Oh, it's four of them. Here we go. Now IntelliJ idea allows me to run this here. It's pretty cool. This is not the free edition though. This uh, ultimate or whatever it's called. Uh, so we have, I apologize if there are going to appear, if, they, if, if, if bad words appear here, <laughs> you have been warned. It's random, really random words, right? <clears throat> I downloaded this database from somewhere. Very good. So we have the repository ready. Obviously we need a word service. And it's going to be a REST controller. Request mapping slash. Of course you should do something like API and versioning. But uh, this demo, that's fine. Uh, public, public, if I can type that public um, list of word. It's almost like a, like a wrapper, right? Word, uh, find, uh, find words. Let's call it the same, doesn't matter, int limit. <clears throat> and this is gonna be a request mapping called slash words. And it's gonna be a param, request param. And uh, we just, well, we need the repository, private final word repository, word repository. And since we are using Lombok, we can say a required args constructor. So this just adds automatically this constructor over here with repository. Anyway, um, Let's return what the repository returns first, limit, right? But <clears throat> this is rarely the case. And this is where I have found that maybe a reactive programming is more useful in, at least in my experiments. So you rarely just query database and do nothing else. You, sometimes you have to do something with that data or something else, right? So it simulate that. And that's where I brought Spring Security actually. So what we're gonna do is uh, how can we do this? We're gonna map this. Well, we need a stream. It's a collection. So we need a stream. And then we're gonna map each word on something called maybe a field data. And we pass the word. Let's implement these. Oh, well, we need to also, we need to collect these as a list. So we return that. We could also return a stream, but let's, let's do it this way. Now let's implement this. This is a word. And that's also a word. And I could use thread.sleep, but I feel like it's not, it's, it's not real. It doesn't feel real. So instead of that, I thought, what kind of uh, um, uh, operation can I emulate? And so I can use a password encoder that takes time to run. And this one is one of those. That's the reason it's so, it's so secure because it takes time to to encode something. So I'll say the encoder and encode the word dot get text, for example. And so this is the in encoded version. And now we take the word and set, we need maybe another field for this. 
private string data, but we are not gonna persist this. So transient from Java persistence dot set data encoded. So now we are simulating some actual work, right? Mm, that's gonna take time. We can change this with a method reference. And I guess, I guess I missed something, the database connection, right? We have it here. So let's do that. Uh, first, actually, let me configure the server port to 8080 just to, because we're gonna create an, another one if we have the time, I hope we can make it. Um, data source, uh, URL, JDBC, uh, MariaDB, slash, slash, localhost, 3306, slash, Wordle. Uh, we need the data source, username is user, data source, password is actually very secure. <laughs> data source, what is doing it? You know what, Hikari, so this uh, uh, connection pool, Hikari, but I want to configure maybe maximum pool size, let's say it's 10 and and and, and connection timeout uh, 10 seconds. I think that's how you configure it, I hope. That's correct. I started to run this real quick and hope I didn't make any mistakes. Uh, I know what's gonna happen. It's not gonna work because let's jump here. Mm, because localhost, well, if you will go there, it's gonna show this spring security shows this. So we need to disable that. Well, maybe you learned something here. Uh, I don't know. So it's something called exclusions. Exclude, uh, we need to security, security out configuration. We don't want that. Just do that again. And now we can just words limit. Let's query 10, 10 words. And there you go. So it was kind of fast, but not super fast. So it takes takes time as you can see. So click done. Right. Uh, if we if we query, for example, 100, then it's gonna take more time. There we go. It's processing. Right? It's processing. And 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 come on, give me those. 100 words, there we go, so we have. And it, this is a, a JSON array with all the objects here, right, the words. And this is the, the calculated stuff. It, it doesn't mean anything, but it's an encrypted, encrypted version of the, of the text. Very good. Mm, that's fine. So that is a blocking, a blocking service. There's nothing wrong about it, but let's, let's do a, uh, where is it, reactive, is it this one, reactive programming version, no, it's not reactive programming, it's, it's reactive service, there we go. So this again, uh, Spring Initializer, and instead of a JDBC, I'm using data, R2DBC, security, and web flux instead of web. And because I'm an, on a Mac, so I need to use, uh, uh, I need to add this one, maybe all, I think maybe in, on Windows and Linux machines, maybe you don't need that one, you will have to try. It. And then we have the R2DBC MariaDB driver, not the JDBC driver. We also have Lumbok, et cetera. So the reactive service actually have it here. Okay, maybe maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, so I'm sure I'm gonna show you. It's the same, I actually copy pasted this, but I just changed, I'd removed the entity and I use, well, data, I left data. It's not, a, it's not an entity anymore. And then there's ID from org spring framework data annotation. This is not an entity. And look, we don't need the transient annotation here. It's not an entity. <laughs> Word repository is the same, except it's a R2DBC repository of Word ID long. The same query, the only difference, it returns a flux now. So it's not gonna block. So you see how it's much easier than that R2DBC code that I showed you before. It's, it's just super simple. Here it is, that's it. Now you have a reactive, uh, connection to the database, that's super cool. The word service is the same, except again, it returns a flux. And because we are returning a flux, now we can return another media type. It's This is a different, right? Different, just in case. I don't know if I mentioned it. This is a different project. It's not the blocking service. No, it's the reactive service. So uh, now because we are returning a flux, we can return a text event stream value. That's super cool because there is something called event stream. Mm, which is a JavaScript API that you can use in the browser. So that part is not gonna be blocking either. Super cool, right? This exactly the same, same thing here. I literally copy pasted this from the other project. Mm, and then 
uh, maybe okay this i didn't do this that's actually good because maybe i can i can go through this a bit slower so let's well first server port let's go with 9090 here r2 dbc now we are going to con to to kind of connect to the same mariadb database but using r2 dbc so r2 dbc mariadb it's almost the same really uh local host 3306 wordle wordle uh, r2 dbc uh, uh username user r2 dbc password password don't use that in production not even in development you shouldn't especially if you have sensitive data <laughs> i don't have any sensitive data so it's fine um let's max size uh, 10 it was a default apparently but i uh, want to make sure it's, it's clear and the connection time maximum time to wait yeah this one we're gonna uh what was this i think it was 10 seconds let me check here now this reactive programming uh, blocking service we had 10 seconds okay back to the reactive service i think you have to do this let me check i have some notes here because i, I always forget that 10 seconds yeah okay so that's that's a correct notation mm. and this print security thing right we, we don't want that so uh um exclude actually exclude oh, we need the reactive security in that one very good so we don't show this this thing just i'm doing the same just translating now to to reactive but the important part is the flux really that's the important part let's run this fingers crossed let's see if it runs it started let me go to the browser where is it here let's open a new one 90 90 and let's query i have one with 100 so check check this out i'm gonna hit enter and then some data is gonna come in but not all of it look if it works <laughs> hopefully it works there we go i'm scrolling down and you see you see things coming that's pretty cool so that's the advantage we are not blocking we can do more stuff now um that was amazing let me go to the presentation where do i have the presentation here, let's see if I can go through this very quickly. JDBC versus R2DBC. There's a lot of talk there. Uh, Brian Goetz, he said, I think Project Loom is going to kill reactive programming. And that's because Project Loom is going to be uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a way to create uh, fibers, I think it's called, which is much cheaper than threats. Threats consume operating system resources. They are expensive. He says that. So you should check this out also. Mm, Gaetano Piazzola, he's, he wrote this amazing piece on an epic tale comparing a DBC and R2DBC in a real world scenario. And yeah, it's just one real world scenario. Maybe there are many, so that's the only critique I would, I would uh, give to this, but it's an amazing piece. You should read it, uh, go through it, and maybe try his code. He found this, that this only that well this result that rdbc is better in this peculiar and very specific case so he found one case where it was uh, actually better mm. but there are there's the other kind of results so uh martin uh, smith he he wrote also an amazing piece uh where he found different things so uh for best for example for best response times and throughput in spring boot use web flux and rtdbc plus the RTDBC connection pool for best perform response times and throughput in Quarkus use blocking stack with JDBC. Huh? So no throughput bullet again, which is not bad. It's just good. It's just, uh, we are more informed now on when to use this. The way I'd like to explain reactive programming, and, and, and this is important when you are going to compare, is that let's say, let's make a, an analogy here. Let's say you have an appointment somewhere. You arrive there to this building and there is a secretary there sitting by the, this desk and they they tell you please wait that's the traditional or imperative way right that's what we do uh, and normally mm -hmm. uh, you just wait but if they tell you hey i'll call you back then you can say i'll go do something else that's the difference so this is their reactive way now in the end you do more things, you have the opportunity at least to do more things, only if you have that use case. Sometimes you really cannot do anything else. So what's the point? It's the same. 
it could be even worse the reactive way because it adds stuff. It adds stuff. In the end, the service time is, is the same, right? When you meet this person, it's going to be the same. And for that, I'm going to show you. I don't know if we have time. I hope we have time. Uh, I, want, I just want to show you this real quick. Artillery, which is a, a tool to, to it's like generator. I just found it that it's easier for this kind of, at least of, um, of presentations. Um, it, it, they have a free uh, kind of a option there with uh, more limited maybe, but it's enough for this. So I'm going to create a new YAML file here. Uh, or T uh, it could be any name, name really, Jamal. There we go. Oh, it's already there. Well, that's good, that's good. We say one step, it's already here. So here it is, I was just going to actually paste this stuff. And so this is the reactive. So let's go with 9090. Let me check if I have it here. Maybe I don't have it. Uh, artillery, okay. And this is uh, 8080. So, okay. Blocking service, we have this file that says, hey, we're going to request a local host 8080. That's this app. And just one second, that's it. But in that second, we are going to send 100 requests per second. It's one second, so it's going to be only one, uh, 100. And uh, timeout, we can wait up to 20, which is a lot, actually, to consider to, to wait for the response. And we're going to just uh, add this to this uh, target, right? Just the words. 100. Now, how, how do we run this? I have it here actually, but I'm going to show you. Artillery run, and then you pass the name of the file. Um, and now it's, uh, it's kind of uh, uh, load testing this application, the blocking service. So let's see what are the results. Uh, uh, I haven't checked as I'm streaming. Streaming consumes some more power from the machine. Uh, but uh, maybe we, we see, well, we'll find out. What are we find out? We find out. So. Uh, HTTP code 200, which is okay, nine. So nine were went through perfectly. How about this one? So uh, artillery run the file. Uh, again, one second, just stressing the system with 100 in one second and see what, what the reactive service can do. Let's see if it's better or not. Uh, uh, I, I tested before it was better. Mm, but if you play with the variables there, with all these times, things change really. And I encourage you, uh, encourage you to, to to try it out. Nineteen. So there we go. Nineteen. The other one was nine nine OK codes versus nineteen because so throughput was better in this case for React service. You can change all all these and you'll find different things. Maybe if you only query. Maybe you have only one. To, things could change really, and you might not notice any difference at all. So uh, let me check the time, uh, 6.04 here in Finland. Thank you for attending this presentation. I hope you, you, you found something informative here. Uh, you can contact me through email, through uh, Twitter. I only tweet about really a programming stuff there if you're interested. There is a bunch of uh, code on, on my GitHub as well, where I'm going to uh, publish this code later after this talk. And uh, yeah, thank you again. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Alejandro. You know, it's a wonderful session, uh, especially, you know, the part about uh, doing the benchmarking between reactive programming and uh, the normal JDBC. And, you know, in most cases, and uh, in most cases, actually, it's, the difference comes down to Kind of picking the right thing, you know. This, yeah, I mean, it's not a trade off between speed, actually. So, yeah, and that's that's a very that's Absolutely. a very good insight, yeah. Uh, and and I really loud the uh, code walkthroughs. Uh, so, I've got like a lot of questions, but I'll just like pick one. Uh, you know, firstly, you know, uh, there's some appreciation. Uh, you know, there's one person who says that you know your your tutorials on Wadim, you know, has gone through them on YouTube. So, he has oh. some kind <laughs> words to say about that. Uh, and and really like this session too, the agenda and everything. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know nice. that the question that I want to ask is, you know, in in projects where uh, that are not really built on this whole principle of reactive programming, can we still use react reactive relational database connectivity in some parts? So can we do that? We can. We can definitely. We can. I mean. Uh... 
that it's not that we cannot, not at the technical level. Maybe the question goes more into, uh, does it make sense or do we gain something from that? Uh, it's really hard to tell, like I showed, or like I said, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't show that, but you modify these parameters there in the test and you get opposite results. And as you saw, I, I just uh, quoted some guys there who found kind of different things because they are using different architectures, different things, and maybe they are not processing as much in, in parallel. I think that's key. I have the, don't, don't, don't trust me 100% on this, but I have the feeling that uh, if, you if you have a lot of processing that you can do in parallel while the database is doing something. And here I show that actually using a local database. If I had used uh, uh, a Sky SQL, which uh, I should have done that, but I didn't have time. Uh, uh, then you, you have processing power there and now you have full processing power here in a way, right? So the difference could be even greater. Uh, but if you don't have it, that's, that's not your use case. And many, many applications it's like that. They don't have that use case. It doesn't make sense. If you combine what happens, uh, everything is done blocking here. Cool. But when you make the call to an external service, in this case, a database, if, if you have to wait, so, okay, select all from wherever. And then now you are just waiting. Fine. So you, you block, you cannot do anything in that time. So it kind of, it's almost like it doesn't make sense. You, you, uh, my advice is you either go fully reactive or you, or you don't. Right, got it, got it, yeah. Thanks a lot, so very well, and a great session. Uh, and we'll try and get you on for another session. Uh, you know, thanks uh, from Absolutely. all of us here at Startup. Thank you, thank you very much for having me. Uh, we have fun, uh, I had to hurry up a little bit at the end, but I hope it was uh, informative. <laughs> yeah, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.